<laughs> well, slowly start. Uh, more people may join us uh, throughout the, the, the coming, let's say, five, ten minutes. But uh, we will open the cafe and serve the first drink. I'm your host for tonight, your bartender for tonight. Uh, so this is a cafe for the ones that come for the first time. Uh, welcome. Uh, the um, invitation is uh, that uh, we will have a conversation all together. Uh, the, we have uh, Faye Stevens with us for the provocation, opening a conversation. So, uh, but it is not only listening and answering or asking questions. Uh, it's about uh, sharing your practice, your visions, your ideas, uh, your disagreements, your agreements, uh, as in a real cafe. There is no beginning, there is no end, um, in the sense that you can stay as long as you want. The cafe is open to the last man or last woman standing. Um, but if you feel like going, feel free uh, to leave and, or even to come back. Um, and I, um, the, the, I would like to, of course, to, to introduce you to, to Faye, Faye Stevens. Uh, she's an archaeologist. But not an archaeologist in the traditional sense of the word. Uh, she is an archaeologist of the mind, of the soul, of the imaginary. Uh, that is uh, um, that you find in the soul of reality. Uh, she, um, the past is for her only a pretext to be in the present and to look forward to the future, uh, the, um, and not only uh, focused on the. Uh, on the vertical, but on the horizontal, uh, by introducing walking as a, um, a way of uh, being, as a way of being panoramic, uh, and as well um, uh, drawing in this horizontal world of moving. So, Faye, I invite you to tell us something more about uh, yourself and your practice. Thank you so much, uh, Gert, and thank you for that very beautiful introduction. Um, it was lovely to hear how others see and view your work, and you're absolutely right in everything that you say, which is just really wonderful to hear. Um, and welcome to you um, all. Thank you also to Babak and Walk, Listen, Create, um, and all the wonderful, wonderful work that they do. And um, and the great, fantastic repository that is on the Walk, Listen, Create site. And there's just some fantastic material in there in many forms um, to engage with and to interact with as well. So I'm delighted to be talking to you today about um, just one element um, of um, the work that I do. I, I say one element. Um, Gert is right in his introduction. That my, my work, all of my work, my academic work, my artistic work, the way I live my life, um, is a, has a, a, a deep philosophy to it. And um, maybe we can talk about that. It's a cafe, so it's a great opportunity to talk about that philosophy it's from many strands. Um, it's very uh, natural and intuitive, but it also has a, a deep context there as well. So I want to um, talk, uh, use a, a lens in a sense, use an experience that I have had and an experience I continue to have with a particular group of people and how an artistic residency produced a body of work that um, still continues um, um, on, which um, I can talk to you um, about. I want to do that in a way this evening that um, focuses on the theme of embodied cartography. Now, this is a term that I um, put together um, and curated a quite large scale exhibition and a series of performance events in two um, here in Bath, but it was a really global event, some wonderful artworks, some incredible performances. And it's some work I'm sort of writing about and editing now as at the time, um, uh, sorry, at the moment. Um, but that's not an end point in a sense. These things are always just. And uh, when I was starting to think about uh, this cafe and thinking about um, what aspect of the work I wanted to talk about, it's always the embodied cartography is always my primary lens. And, and I can see that in some respects, 
Um, what I'm about to talk to you about is not necessarily the genesis of that idea, but most definitely the real beginnings of that particular um, process, amongst many processes that, that I'm going to um, talk about. So what I will do is I'm just going to show a few images. It's always really useful to get some images. I'll just talk through this particular event, um, and then I really want to open it up for discussion for us to um, see where we go in our perambulations around this theme of embodied cartography. So I'll just share the screen. Um, I assume that's right. Can you see the screen okay? Yep, great. Thanks, Baba. Um, I assume it's going to move. Hang on, I'm just working my technology out. Um, okay, I think I've got that. Okay. Oh. Some reason I can't. Now I can. Great. So, uh, thanks for your patience there for a moment. So, the general feel of this cafe. Um, is not a title, although that does look like a title. It really is a feel. Um, walking, drawing, and embodied cartography. And I want to talk about that through some work I've done at a site called Petork Lake in Hungary. And this is part of a residency, one of uh, a few residencies I've held with an incredible group of artists and now very good, much loved friends and colleagues of uh, Kaposvár in Hungary. And for this particular residency, we were based uh, in this rather beautiful lake known as Petork Lake, um, which is what I'm going to talk about. So I walk. I walk because I like to walk. I walk um, because it helps me understand and as a landscape archaeologist, terrain and cartography is very much part of my focus. I see my walking as a choreography across the landscape, and I'm interested in how that choreography might be articulated in some way. And in a sense, all of my work is an experimentation, and it's constantly, I'm a constantly in process experimentation person, um, is this inscription of cartography in many shapes and forms. I, I'm going um, to interrupt you for a second. Yes. Sorry. I'm seeing a squashed screen, and it seems that I'm not the only one. Is that it, true? It, I see a very thin strip of um, of your screen only. Can you? Shall I come out and try again? Yeah. Let me come. Out. Let me stop sharing. Okay. Thanks for letting me know about that. Um, let me try and screen share again. If it works there, how does that work now? Yeah, now it's fine. Now it's fine. Great. Jumped after a minute, but it it seems to be okay. Okay, cool. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry. Oh no, thanks for letting me know. Um, so I I uh, that term specialist is a big, uh, big word, but my focus of attention, let's say, is on the philosophy of phenomenology, and there is a background to that. I was part of a very radical group of archaeologists during a period of time. And we I'm going together. to interrupt you again, sorry, yes. <laughs> because I'm seeing your blue jean screen, not your presentation. Okay, um, right, let's try again. Um, yeah, you just need to select uh, the Chrome browser inside of the menu that will open if yeah. you click on the yeah. share screen, and then we are ready to go. No, now, it, now it's squashed again. Oh, it's, yes, we're, we're getting there. Again? And now, okay. it, and now there's nothing for me. Right, I'll try again. Uh, let me see if. Um, right, try this. How about how's that look? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is good. Yeah. Good? Yes. Hooray. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. We've got that. All right, and this looks good. Beautiful. I want to yes. be there now, Perfect. although it looks there too cold. We are. 
Thank goodness. Thank you. Yeah, Bella. So Thanks for that. It's always good to just get it right. Um, thank you, everyone, for your patience again as well. So um, the experience of landscape, this radical group that I was part of for five um, years and uh, walking and how we understand terrain and the human presence in terrain can be seen as part of that walking process. So I very much take my lead from uh, existentialist philosophy, um, what one might call existentialist walking, um, the walking and phenomenology of place or sensory perambulation, as Aura Sartre most beautifully puts here, I exist. It is so soft and so soft, so slow and light. It seems as though it suspends in the air, it moves. And here I am walking across a very cold, snowy landscape um, in Wiltshire in the UK. I want to talk about today, which is coming from a lovely conversation we get about one of the things I do to record that walking process, um, which I broadly call kinetic drawing machines. And it is very broadly, as you will see in a moment. Um, it's very Heath Robinson, if you know what I buy that. Um, so to give you an example, this image to the left is the amazing site of Avebury, a Neolithic ancient uh, archaeological site. And you can see in the image uh, a series of figures walking across the top of the bank of the Henge Monument, as it's known. And here I am walking in the ditch. Um, no people walking in the ditch there. Um, but I am walking in the ditch. And actually what I'm doing is I'm recording the terrain um, and the walk uh, in that ditch um, in the back of my rucksack. And this is as... as um, uh, as simple as it gets in this case, I do use other techniques as well. Uh, in the back of my rucksack is a box with pens suspended on string and a piece of paper in the bottom of the box. And as I'm moving, the pens and the string are recording and making marks on the paper and um, inscribing my corporeality, my body, as it's moving. On my back, you can do it in other parts of the body there um, as well. That's very deep phenomenological idea that for Merleau-Ponty, my body is a thing among things. It's caught in the fabric of the world. And this idea that the body is in this sort of textured, um, embedded way of being in landscapes and how can we really record our bodily movements. Before I start to show some pictures um, of the people that I um, worked with in Hungary, I do I want to acknowledge them. The image on the middle is the Kapuschvar Arts uh, Community. Um, to the left is Bath Artist Studios, and to the right is Bath and Kapuschvar Twinning Association. This is a synergy between these three um, places. I have a studio at Bath Artist Studios. I have good friends and colleagues at the Kapuschvar, um, Bath Kapuschvar Twinning Association. Um, and uh, as I said before, great friends and colleagues at Kapuschvar Arts. And my um, presence on the residency and on the other residency I've held um, are funded by them. So this is uh, Petwalk Lake. Um, it's, um, it's a soft lake. Um, it takes about an hour to walk around the uh, circumference of it. It is a beautiful lake for swimming, and in the Hungarian summer, it is a um, really essential way of um, cooling down in um, very hot, humid summers that you get in this area um, in Hungary as well. Uh, my residency started off quite gentle and slow. I just found my feet a little bit, to use the pun there. Um, and I started to take walks around the lake uh, as a thinking process. What am I, you know, um, you know, produce something that is of interest to myself and to others. And in my walking around the lake, I started to just do that thing, put my um, box in the back of my rucksack, some pens and I, I also did it in different parts of the body and I walked around much to the um, amusement of my Hungarian colleagues who were asking what on earth I was doing every day walking around with all of these contraptions um, around me. And on the final day I decided to do a final walk and I did two things I decided that I was going to draw a line around the circumference of the lake at the point where the water uh, meets the ground. Um, and I had a very large piece of graphite. Um, and the intention was to um, 
really think about I was um, I'm very interested in fractals and and I draw so I, I'm in lines so my intention was to draw a line around the circumference of the lake and I was sitting and drinking Palinka the previous evening with my Hungarian colleagues and they were asking what I was up to and I decided that this would then become an invitation for them to join me while I was drawing a line uh, which is a very arduous act I have to say around the edge of the lake um, and they could join me as a as a pilgrimage around the lake with me and I would give them each a kinetic drawing machine um, which was really just uh, uh, scavenged out of the rubbish <laughs> so jam jars and boxes and all kinds of things and I spent the night putting together these various kinetic drawing machines and the following day as an end to our residency we gave a pil walked a pilgrimage around the edge of the lake I drew a line around the edge of the lake with this large piece of graphite and everyone had their little drawing machines with them. At the point where we got to where the line, where I could join the line back up again, which was about a foot in length, I had this incredibly strange experience. A foot in length, there's like a small footstep. And we were all walking and very hot and, and there was a lovely feel, a very jubilant feel amongst the group. And stopped and I I had this moment where I found it a real challenge to connect the line up and I went through this incredible uh, process of self-reflection quite rapid self-reflection what am I doing what am I doing here why am I drawing a line around the lake? why have I invited all these people to walk around the lake with all of these contraptions what will happen when I connect the line it was that what will happen when I connect the line, when I take that step, the walk of one step that brings everything together and encircles the lake with this line. And it felt so powerful and it felt, um, I don't know, there's a very, very strong feeling amongst all of us. We were standing there, everyone was watching me and I was kind of slightly frozen. And then very rapidly, I connected the line together. All took a deep breath and laughed. I then picked up the piece of graphite and invited everyone to hold out their hand to me and I drew the line on their hand across the top and the bottom of their palm um, with the same piece of graphite and as I did that I said to them we we've become the lake we are an embodiment of the lake and it really was an extraordinarily uh, wonderful moment for all of us I hadn't planned to draw a line on everyone's palm that wasn't a pre-planned purpose it just happened at that time I made that connection with the line so here um, is one of um, my lovely friends and colleagues from uh, the Campus Far Artists. There are many, and the photographs are, are not of everybody, and um, there are probably about um, 15 people who participated. This is Gabor. He um, is a lecturer in painting at um, Kapush Far. And here is his box. This is the box I gave him. And those are his pens, his marked pens. And here I am inscribing his hand um, with the graphite. It was really great to talk with him after he really understood um, what I was doing and he also understood that I was what I was doing was was very intuitive. There was an idea but really the performance uh, makes things happen and you have to trust yourself to the performance, the performance of drawing and see where that leads you and see where that takes you and this is very much what I do uh, with my performance work. This is the piece of graphite. Um, so it's a large piece of graphite, uh, Italian made graphite. Um, and you can see the wearing of the graphite um, itself. It's um, very sort of uh, uh, made a really soft mark, uh, didn't impact on the environment in a detrimental way. Here are, uh, is uh, Gabo and um, Robert. Robert is an incredible printmaker. Um, and, and here Gabo is with the box and with um, the drawings there himself. Uh, uh, 
what Gabor also did was he actually took apart the box because it wasn't just on the paper that the marks were made, but the pen marks were all around the edge of the inside of the box. And he carefully peeled off the surface of the inside of the box with all these mark makings. He rolled it up into a scroll and gave it back to me. So he has his drawing, but he gave me this drawing from the carefully peeled back inscriptions on the inside of the box. It was a lovely moment. Here is to the left is um, Adam and um, Adam, I gave Adam a large box. He's very tall. And, and, um, and when I gave people their kinetic drawing machines, I invited them to have a gesture because it was a pilgrimage. So um, Gabor held his box very close to his chest like this. Um, Adam to the left had to hold it on his head. Um, and in the middle, that is his um, drawing there. And then Andrea, who um, is also a beautiful printmaker, she had a jam jar and she was invited to walk with the jam jar in her hand like this. So it's quite a wobbly walk for her. She said it really made her arm ache. But that's the nature of pilgrimage. So um, and actually from that circle, so hers is a small, tiny drawing, circular drawing. She then made a, a circular copper etching plate um, and etched the drawing onto her etching plate and then produced a series of prints um, from that after a conversation that we had about walking into drawing into print. Something else happened as well on the walk, and, and this is um, something I've been doing this year with um, Walking as a Question Conference, just recently with um, Winchester Heritage Open Day, um, which is this collection, this cabinet, this wunderkammer of performances. And I have a number of these boxes from different performances that I have, and they're, they're kind of quite laboratory-like, quite specifically little vitrines, little um, cabinets, uh, little containers of um, an event of a performance. And sometimes there's a, a, a performance that is an idea and I, I go back into the vitrine and I take things out and I put them in. But this is a one moment in time um, little performance vitrine. And in it you can see the bag in which the um, graphite is held. You can see this long piece of string that I just uh, picked up from the garage of the house that we were staying at. Um, but I want to talk to you a bit about the box. Um, uh, this this paraphernalia I carried around, I carried on the performance around the lake. There is no um, reasoning behind this. It's, it's a really intuitive thing. I pick up the string and I decide the string is going to come with me. Um, this is a box and it's a soapbox. And I um, picked the soapbox out from the rubbish and I inverted it. I sort of dismantled it and put it uh, inside out for some reason. Um, I found some ribbon in the kitchen and I wrapped some ribbon around the box after I had placed uh, certain things in the box. So there's something really extraordinary about spending the summer in Hungary and that is that at night the air and the sky is full of the most beautiful and incredible moths. It's electric. Um, and if you shine a light out into the dark sky, you just see this mass of sparkling moths um, of all different shapes and sizes and species. It's just the most incredible experience. And when you wake up the next morning, you look to the ground and the ground is littered with the bodies of the moths that have passed into the other realm. Their lifespan is short. And I found myself collecting the um, bodies of these moths that have passed on into the other realm, these incredibly delicate um, bodies. And I started to collect them and I put them in this box. Um, so in the box still, are many, 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 I goodness knows what they look like now, I haven't looked, uh, the bodies of the moths. And this, these moths became my totems, my totem animal, my companions on the pilgrimage. And it was really important that I carried them with me on the walk. And so I wrapped the box in the ribbon, I wrapped the string around the box, I wrapped it around my body. And as I walked around the lake, this was very much the um, totem, the talisman of the walk. I didn't tell anyone about that during the time. It was a very personal thing going on between me and the moths, um, but we talked about it afterwards. So this is one of the drawings that I made. Um, looks a bit, uh, it's quite dark, but it's lots and lots and lots of fine lines. Um, it was a 
it was a box with uh, three pens and this one was uh, one that I carried slightly in front of me so I could barely see and I wanted to walk around the lake and, and not see. What I then did with this drawing in the residency was I turned it into a screen print. So, um, and this was a really, really great uh, thing to do. So this is a, a, a triplicate, a triptych of the drawing walk. Um, and I just used these colours, these ochre colours and dark colour, which are very much the colours of the landscape um, that you see in, um, uh, in around the Lake of Petork. And this is a large print. This is um, go to A1 side, I think. Um, and transcribe the drawing into an acetate and these um, theories of screen prints. And in fact, one of these screen prints is about to go into um, quite a large um, exhibition uh, starting um, next week, actually. So I'm looking forward to seeing it in that exhibition space. So we go from drawing and performance and um, pilgrimage and, and talismans and inscription into something that uh, is, for me, a, a small articulation of the walk, a small articulation of the embodied cartography of walking around the lake of Petork, which is uh, this um, screen, sprint, screen print here. So I hope that's given you a flavour for um, what I'm really looking forward to talking with you um, about, and I very much look forward um, to our conversation. Stop sharing there. Super. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Faye, for your gentle provocation and um, uh, to um, uh, open the conversation by by this idea of, of, of writing, drawing. But what but, but, uh, struck me and then what you do is the, the line between drawing and writing seems to be very thin. Um, uh, that you're inscribing in the landscape with your body. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I feel it like you are, uh, it's a form of reading landscape as much as it is writing um, next to drawing. Uh, so um, and I see it uh, almost as a poetical uh, act, a gesture of um, um, the, using your body as a poetical instrument, uh, as an extension of your hands. Uh, uh, the, the whole body that becomes a hand that is uh, writing in the landscape and is becoming the landscape. And now, yes. uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, please, uh, if you have any feedback, comment, uh, questions, uh, or if you want to share something from your own practice, if you feel mm -hmm. resonance with what you do, uh, feel free to uh, uh, to tell us. And yeah, I have two questions. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Faye. That was a wonderful story. And uh, mm -hmm. I think the uh, end result is really interesting, um, <laughs> the, the drawings. Uh, so, and my questions are around the drawings. The first is, uh, mm -hmm. can you um, uh, connect aspects of the drawings with physical aspects of the space? Are you able to, are you able to do this? Because we don't know Paterke Lake, right? But you do, and you might know that particular aspects of the drawing are a consequence of particular aspects of the walk. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second is, I presume that you do this more often. So you have multiple drawings. How do they compare? Mm. Yes, um, that's great. But I will, I'm just going to screen share again. Thanks for that question. Um, right. Um, you might enter into another world. Uh, let's just um, see. Can you see the screen share? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So can you see the, you can see the three the three drawings. It's it's um it's slightly clearer here actually. That other image is a bit over pixelated. Um, so th obviously these are three images of the same walk. So I'll focus on the darker one at the bottom. So Gert, you're absolutely right. Um, this is gestural. Um, and I suppose I'm really interested in, in walking. There's a lot of conversation around our feet um, or our minds, um, that walking frees your mind or um, lots of conversations about the, the, you know, our feet. And I'm really engaged with those um, conversations. 
conditions. It's not to, against those conditions, but um, there really is this gesture of walking, this corporeal gestural uh, idea of walking. And um, I understand this <laughs> drawing very well, Babak. Um, I know, for example, can you see my mouse moving on the screen? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I know that this bit here is um, where I have to take quite a, a, a big leap, um, take a quite a big step to um, go across um, a, a turn um, around the lake. And this bit here, this little noise, is always a little stumble. And even though I've, I've walked it repeatedly, um, I always stumbled at this particular point. There was always a little jolt. Um, and that is always, that is the little jolt there that you can see um, uh, with that too. And you can see that there's this movement like this. There's this swinging movement that goes on. And that is because I'm holding it here. And as I'm walking, there's just this natural swing um, of the body taking place there as well. So that's the stumbling point there. That's a leaping point there. Um, this and this particular walk was where I sneezed. Um, and so we've got this strange line that doesn't sort of, it's slightly different from the other lines there. That's a sneezing line. Um, there and then this little there's a little squiggly lines um, around there and that's also um, a point where I sort of stumbled uh, sort of my body just moved and um, slightly out of kilter so I can see in this babak this this rhythm this gestural rhythm repeated action of the swing here of the body and the um, and the pens and the, the box in front of me and then I see these little still points here of 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 leaping, of sneezing, um, and of um, and of, of slightly stumbling there um, as well. I'm just showing you once. But, uh, drawing. but is this? Hold on. Is this because you've got you had the box in front of you and you were locking into the box as you were drawing? Um, I'm. I tend to on that particular. I do lots of different things, but on that walk, I tended to. Um, hold the box. It's a it's a walk I'd done a number of times before. That's not the first drawing. Um, and I was sort of looking, just sort of gazing ahead, um, and in a sense trying to switch off my ocular walk and really engage with the embodiment of the walk so i'm not closing my eyes but i'm just slightly keeping my eye just slightly ahead of me not looking too much around and really aware that i'm holding the box and i'm moving with the box i'm not trying to over move i'm not trying to do anything but i'm really aware that this is an embodied walk not an ocular walk so in that case that's what i was doing there too and there were a series of walks, but it, it was that um, that one print and it was quite a random selection from the drawing selections. And I thought, oh, that's the one. I, I didn't really look at them very closely or do too much with them. But I thought that's the one I'll turn into the print because then I wanted to see how the print then. Um, uh, 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 in a sense, interprets the drawing. <laughs> because the print is its own art form as well. Even a screen print is, in a sense, a, a replication. It is its own interpretation there as well. And as the screen, as I started producing the screen prints, I started to see different, you know, marks on the screen print um, image that were not present in the, in the drawing image, for, it, for example, particularly in the slightly lighter colors. For some reason, there seemed to be more space in those particular drawings um, as well. Thanks. That's and then sweet. a comparison with other uh, drawings that you have, maybe? Some yes, um, I, um, I don't have um, other drawings from that walk, but I have a whole series of drawings um, from walks. Um, so there's the walk that I did in the in the ditch of the Avebury Henge, which is part of a project that I'm um, curating with other artists at the moment. Um, there's also um, 
a, a drawing I uh, exhibited a couple of years ago, which was uh, a walk around my studio. And it was actually, I just arrived at my studio and I was feeling a bit, what, what shall I do today? And there was a box. So I just picked up the box and um, I just walked around my studio and made those marks with that as well. So there's a whole series of, of different types of, of drawings in this, in this way. But how do they compare? Are, are you able to show um, the comparison between the one from Hungary um, and maybe ones from other places? Oh, no, I don't think I've got them easily to hand. That's a good question. I should have done that. No, okay. I, I don't have them easily to hand here, but I can put something together um, and share with the group um, from other ones. Um, and there was also a, um, a residency I held here in the UK in an arboretum, which was to which was uh, based around um, this incredible collection by this couple, Brian Dilly Bradley, funded. So, uh, so part of that project was a lot of educational work um, with local schools and communities. Um, and so what I did was I invited all these schools and communities to come around. And the arboretum was in this very large paddock, really amazing landscape. And um, the project that I was doing for that arts residency was that the trees did the drawing. So I actually started to suspending pens from <laughs> the trees and um, doing um, drawings. Uh, it's a big project I call the narrative of trees um, because actually each tree has its very own particular way of drawing. So I can look at those drawings and tell you that's a Salix matsundura or that's a you know a weeping pine or that's a horse chestnut because they all walk uh, they all have their own particular way of drawing. And so from an educational context when I worked with school groups I showed drawings and I said, look, this is this is how a weeping willow draws. This is the language of the weeping willow. Um, and then I gave them little kinetic drawing boxes and we walked around the paddocks together. Um, and in a way, I was saying that the mark, the drawings in the same way as you can tell that the tree, you know, the drawing is the tree of the Salix, that the drawings are, that they made walking around the paddocks are the drawings of their own unique bodies, that each drawing is completely unique their narrative, their corporate, their bodily narrative there. And that was great fun, absolutely great fun. And there's a whole series of drawings um, regarding that. And it opens up brilliant discussions around what is a walk and what, um, um, how a walk can be described. And in a sense, those drawings are a, a description of a walk. Amongst many other things, actually, they are a poem, uh, they're, they're a song, um, they, you know, I, I would, um, I should do this actually, give one of those drawings to a friend who's a composer or, or a musician and ask them to play it as if it were a musical performance, see what would happen there. So there's this endless, wonderful sensorial possibilities with that. I'm reminded of two things uh, with your musical notation. Uh, we had um, a few months ago, um, Andrew, I think, is not in the call, but he will remember. We had two authors who uh, also interpreted um, uh, observations as musical notation, but I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was related to birds. I'm sorry, this is half a story. And the other is that uh, your drawings remind me of um, ancient Chinese uh, earthquake detectors. They are quite seismic, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. 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 I really like it. Yes. <laughs> but that's actually something that's a that that's a really interesting conversation in the making there. That idea of seismic earthquake geological mark making and the body as it situates itself in on the land, yeah. on terrain, on geology, soft geology, drift geology, that in a sense the body is its own sort of seismic movement through um, that terrain as well. There is a lovely synergy there and there's a lovely long conversation to be had, sort of a long lingering musing conversation, thoughtful conversation to be had around. Great idea. Does anyone else have any thoughts or does anyone uh, draw or have any drawing techniques that they use in a, in a particular way or walking methodology that they have that 
you'd like to share? Ellie, I'm slightly looking at you because I know you. <laughs> yeah, I've been hovering over the unmute button. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering about the use of the um, kinetic machines, because as a child, mm -hmm. I used to do that in the car, but I would hold a pen over a notebook. Yeah. Get some interesting ones. And recently I did it uh, on a plane taking off, which was also kind of another kind of sort of seismic yeah, reaction. So I was curious as to why mm -hmm. uh, like a disembodied sort of device for making the marks like have, did did you try it first or sort of where did the box come from i think is my question um so what do you mean by disembodied um like uh, compared to just hold uh, holding a pen over a a paper and letting your the movement that way yeah. rather than being suspended in a box um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about the word disembodied, but <laughs> that's right. No, that kind of draw. I mean, that's uh, uh, to be honest, that's the kind of drawing I love doing. I just hold a pen in front of you and just walk and scribble and see see what kind of mark making um, happens. Um, I think the idea with the box and the pens, and it wasn't. It's not a, there is, you know, kinetic drawings are not a, you know, there are a lot out there. Um, but I think the idea for me, after doing the, these lots of walkings and things like that, is that the suspension of the pen is more responsive to the movement of the whole body rather than the hand. And there is a tendency when you're walking like that with a pen, and, and it is a wonderful thing to do, and I do do it, is that you... Um, there is an, a slight element where the mind will control the pen. Even if you're not looking, the mind is, I suppose it's that uh, cognition that we have of left hand, I'm sorry, slightly left handed. So uh, left hand, uh, hand to paper, that that connection of the hand and the, right, the process of writing and inscribing, your brain has a certain cognition with it. So there's an element of control there. And I suppose I wanted to release that element of control. So the box um, with the suspension means that I, apart from holding the box, um, I have no control over the mark making that's taking place there. It, it really, and I can't, I can't think about it. And that's why my gaze is in a particular way as a kind of meditation, you know, the gaze in meditation where you just fix your points slightly like just ahead of you there, um, that I'm trying to release the control of my mind um, so that my senses and my body really are the inscribers, the, the authors, the, 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 um, yeah, the inscribers of that as well. And I, interestingly, with the drawing that I showed you there with the triptych, I, I see that also as three voices, and that, that started to make me ponder about my, you know, three selves, you know, that these drawings just offer you so many possibilities for deep philosophical thinking, which I really think is what's going on here. But um, the, um, this idea that there's sort of different bodies and different senses. But uh, this idea of a disembodied drawing is quite an interesting question, Ellie. Cool, thank you. I'm trying to develop a performance walk of a, a ritual. I think I've, if anyone's heard me talk about this before, I've been doing some um, performance walks along the Seine River in Brussels, which is rooted underground. So I did a first walk kind of as a, very much a performance walk as a water spirit trying to find my way home. But I'm trying to develop that into a more ritual procession for a an in, small invited mm -hmm. audience. So this is super interesting, <laughs> especially the walking around a lake oh. in particular. I mean, yes. Yeah. So let thanks. me know, Ellie. It's, yes, if we went in pandemic, I'd whiz over and see you straight away, and you can show me the walk. But um, yes, keep me keep us posted on that. That sounds fascinating. It's, you know, um, Ellie, uh, there is something about this. So you're doing that walk. I know you're doing, you, you're doing these ritual walks there. There is something about the solo walk. And then there is something really uh, 
beautiful and profound about inviting people to take a walk with you. It's a real gesture um, and um, it comes from a very interesting place in the head and the heart. And then when you invite people to take a walk with you and you, and you <laughs> gift them, boxes and jars, things like that, um, and, and move around together. There is this real sense of, of something's happening. Something's happening. You don't know That's what really it is. Cool. Yeah. It doesn't need describing, but you're in it and you know that something extraordinary is happening. And, um, and I'd really you know, encourage you to invite people to walk with you and think about that notion of the the invitation, the gesture of the invitation to walk collectively and inscribe collectively. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Faye. I've got a question on that, actually, because you talked about. Uh, hi, Jackie. Um, hi, you talked too. about gesture and pilgrimage, and I wondered if you could just like talk about that a bit more. I didn't really understand gesture in that context. So. Uh, the relationship between gesture and pilgrimage. Um, yeah. Right. Um, well, we embark on pil pilgrimages have a they have an intention, generally an intention of the spirit or the soul, if we want to take that idea of the, the pilgrimage there. So we can talk about um, the Camino, for example, ending up at the Compostela de Santiago and that uh, religious context. We can talk about the pilgrimage up Crow Patrick on the west coast of Ireland, that you walk barefoot um, amongst the, the many saints and religious. So there's a, there's a religious or spiritual connotation to the idea of pilgrimage. And there's the idea of pilgrimage that has many internal um, uh, dynamics to it. So it's the often, not always, but often the pilgrimage has um, some kind of religious connotation, um, uh, a Buddhist pilgrimage, uh, uh, a Christian pilgrimage, whatever it happens to be, there, there, there is a, uh, uh, some kind of faith, let's say, associated with that. And people take part in it because they are deeply invested in that faith. And people take part not because they're necessarily deeply invested in the faith, but they, they want to feel that experience. Um, but then as the also happens at that same time is the pilgrimage within, which is part of that too. Um, so we go, we start to walk into our own internal terrain um, and perambulate through that. Um, and I do quite a lot of work, this work uh, with um, some of my writing students actually on, on this pilgrimage of the internal terrain. You know, what is your or in a sense, I work I do with them, so if I read your piece of work, what, what is the terrain of your writing? Is it a flatland? Is it a mountain? Are you, going to take me, are you going to take me walking across a river? Am I going to have to stumble over things? Am I going to have to climb over things? Am I going to have to wade through water? What is that terrain of your, your writing? And, and there is that sense of that sense of the pilgrimage within. So it's true through our writing, but when we walk on a walk, that idea of that sense that there's something going on in. Pilgrimages are also inherently individual, but also collective, inscribed walks many, many times. So there are a number of gestures just within that very description of being um, on a pilgrimage. Um, and those gestures that I've just described are related to doctrine, for example, of faith or an internal sense of journey. So. How does the body connect to that? And what um, how can we, how can I, for example, or how can we start to think about not intellectualizing our body, but being deeply phenomenological and sensorial, doing something which we, the body records and produces a, something called a drawing, called a gestural drawing, if that's what you want to call it, it could be called many things, that I then, I then look at that drawing and read it or engage with it as, as a gesture, as a language there as well. It comes, my body 
I'm speaking very much like a phenomenon, like my body comes back at me and, and teaches me and guides me and informs me in, in many ways. So that's what I, why I put gesture and pilgrimage together in that way. I hope that, yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah, that helps. <laughs> yeah. So do you see your yes. drawings? The, those are the gestures, the drawings that you're making. Um, partly, um, the walking is the gesture, um, yeah. as, as well. Um, and I suppose, yes, I mean, the answer is yes, but I'm slight, I'm slightly musing because, um, I think it's more than gesture in the singular, got more things going on. Yeah. Um, let's say gestural rather than gesture and then the gestural gives us the opportunity to think about those many facets of what what gestural might um might mean there so jackie do you walk and draw i do yeah but i'm well i've been asked to think about pilgrimage particularly actually i do walk and draw and that's why i'm here but i was just interested to hear you talking about that and i was interested mm. in the idea of non-religious pilgrimage and what that might mean and i yeah. wondered if anybody else had any thoughts on that whether it whether it really does have to have a spiritual connotation or whether there is something else because i you use the word intention which is what i've been thinking about you know a journey with an intention yeah and, and Jackie, whether, that's, whether I mean, that's enough yeah that's I, great i mean i think it'd be great to hear from everyone else but the the walk around the lake in petok um, it was not a religious pilgrimage. I very specifically called it a pilgrimage because it was a pilgrimage, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't. It wasn't religious. But somehow along the way, the moths became really important to me personally, <laughs> <laughs> and this box of dead moths became really talismatic for me. Um, and they're still there. They're in. They're in that little box, and they're in my studio, and they're, and they're still there. Um, I don't know if that's religion or faith, but there was something. Um, I think it's it a relic. Really it's a relic, and it's also. <laughs> place because the big thing about that area of Hungary in the evening are the moths um, and so that's the nightscape in a sense and they are they are they are present as the night creatures and the night terrain and it was really important to me that it that they became you know they were present and I think that's why I put them in a box and closed the box because that's the little night world but I carried them with me and they, of course, they transform the landscape. They transform how you move, because when you attempt to move into this great mass of moths, it, you know, your walking and gestures are very different there as well. So it's, it became very important to me that they were present and somehow that linked to me uh, with my pilgrimage on that um, walk there. But that's a great question, Jackie. Does anyone have any other um, thoughts or responses to um, Jackie's question? question there. I don't know if you want to say it again, Jackie, just in case. Yeah, I was just interested in the idea of non-religious pilgrimage and what that might mean to people, what that might be, and how much it has to have some sort of spiritual intention. Well, it doesn't have to have anything. It could be anything, really. But um, I just wondered what it conjured up for people, really. I'll take a little stab at this. Uh, but not that I'm a specialist anyway, but um, <laughs> I think I could make the case for that uh, a pilgrimage doesn't have to be, is not necessarily religious, but I would guess that if it's not spiritual, I don't think anybody would call it a pilgrimage. I don't think you can have a pilgrimage if it's not spiritual. And if it's spiritual, then it's almost like saying it's religious. It's just not Christian or Muslim or Hindu necessarily. but. Anything that's spiritual, in a way, is religious. Just maybe not conventional religious religion. That was my two cents. Thanks. Uh, but, uh, to add my two cents to that, actually, you have the labyrinth as a um, representation of of, of, an, of the pilgrimage, uh, which is an, um, a movement uh, in within. Actually, it's, it's like making a drawing already. And then what, what's striking me in pilgrimage is that you actually are entering an unknown terrain. You may have a final destination, but you don't know where you are going because um, normally you are doing it or you're walking uh, the trajectory for the first time. So you do it for the first time. It is a first time experience, which makes it uh, something completely new. Um, 
and um, the, um, what, what, what I what I see and then and, and, and this uh, and it has much to do with the gesture as well because uh, I see in your performance FA that the carrying is a form of caring right? uh, uh, you are um, uh, giving a, attention to uh, to the landscape to what is around you uh, it, it's a form of it's a gesture of, of, of a very delicate gesture it's a very uh, it's non-invasive it's it's an um, uh, almost a tender gesture you're making with the smallest movements possible uh, and uh, allowing the smallest movements possible to happen uh, which is for me is a very spiritual experience as well uh, to give to, to give a, a space to the small and then to the small to to grow uh, like uh, like a seed, uh, like caring for the seed, uh, so uh, so it can uh, become um, a plant or a tree. Uh, the, the walking is for me, for me personally, in my personal practice. Uh, the, uh, I'm doing um, silent walks. Actually, I'm doing this together with a Puerto Rican uh, dancer, Maria Les Burgos Menendez. And uh, we, uh, uh, our methodology to let control go is uh, to make silent walking groups uh, for uh, for long periods, uh, for three, four hours. Uh, the, the, uh, the letting deciding in the group, uh, everybody at a turn that is coming up spontaneously, uh, to to take a direction or go to or to uh, to a certain um, uh, on a certain way, um, and so. After a while, being somewhere where you are not, uh, um, uh, the, where you not could could know in advance where you were going, and actually be, becoming completely lost. Uh, the, the, the the whole idea of, of, of the performances I do is that you do this in an unknown terrain, uh, so you are coming in the state of of completely being. Uh, sort of like detached uh, in, a, in the in a positive sense of the world, uh, in a world uh, detached in the sense of of not anymore, um, have not having control anymore. And to, but at the same time, to do this in a group, feeling cared for, uh, not feeling alone, uh, feeling uh, together. Uh, now, um, uh, another thing that we did actually, uh, uh, about, that we actually do is, is, is we are doing performances together, uh, which are always in silence, uh, the, the, me and Maria Liz, uh, the, 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 the both of us, and we decided uh, only to perform together uh, when, because she's in, like me and, and, and a nomad and traveling around the world, but only to perform together when we are in the same city, but not knowing in advance that we will be in the same city. So that we are in the same place, and if about that we are in the same city, then we, we make a silent performance. And, the, and this happened now eight times uh, the, uh, in various cities of the world uh, that we <laughs> that it just happened. And I think letting go of this control, uh, and then I, I, it's not two cents anymore, it's like already, uh, I think. Uh, uh, Ten years, but uh, the, uh, uh, letting the letting things happen is a, is a state of being. It, it's it's uh, and that is reflected in walking. Walking is maybe the last act uh, of freedom. The thing that you do without consuming, without um, uh, producing, um, without being invasive. Uh, so uh, it it gives you the possibility to have this state of, of just uh, being uh, in an. Um, and detached and in a, in a, in a completely free way uh, and connected with what is around you. Um, so um, in that sense, for, walking is for me spiritual, uh, even if it's not in a traditional way spiritual. Um, mm. That was 50 euros. <laughs> Um, yeah, I put a quick note in the chat when this first came up, but I'll say it again, I guess, because I thought of something else too, but that I was talking about this the other day and found myself saying, like, a pilgrimage is a walk for something greater than yourself, which mm -hmm. sort of encompasses the religious, spiritual sort of in one, I hope. But I like what you were saying, Faye, about it also being an interior journey as well. Mm -hmm. So it's your energy is might be focused outward at the beginning but the act of walking kind of like necessarily brings you back to yourself as well yeah that's a great uh, thought there Ellie. i i 
Um, I don't think that the walk is greater than the self. It is the self. And the self is a beautiful enigma to us all. So what better way for us to, to connect, to um, align, to, you know, just have the smallest sense of the self, the unknown self, that the walk is the self. And that is huge and that is, is more than enough. Then it becomes this, this cosmos of possibilities, in a sense, because of course we know ourselves and we we really don't know ourselves at the same time. How does the body and how does walking help us if we want to take the pilgrimage as a as a as a healing process, as a spiritual process? How does that spiritual process of the walk and the self um, really? have moments where there's this this connection and an understanding that is a beautiful reveal of the self to the self um and uh it's rare and it's wonderful when it happens um so i sometimes don't it's a it's a lovely thought Ellie. i just sometimes think we don't need to to want more than that is that that idea of the self is is the great thing in a sense <laughs> um, and to and in a sense also that um, with the walk and with those intentions and, and aspirations that we have with the walk like the pilgrimage it it becomes expansive and it moves um, outwards as a gesture when when I suppose I'm really interested in how the walk helps us to kind of move inwards and how those terrains that we perambulate in you know you can say so, so what does a fenland walk offer to the self or the mountain walk to the self that that movement forward is also wonderfully sort of reflexive and just but you know kind of comes back not as a mirror because a mirror is too um too didactic but there's this, just this reflexivity going on. Move forward and towards so that you can come back towards and into there as well. And I think that's why pilgrimage is such an interesting lens to use when we're starting to explore those quite conceptual thoughts and ideas about the, the wonderful unknownness of ourselves to ourselves. And the body can tell us, you know, the body is a great informer um and holds many stories and many um many knowledges that we can we can learn about from ourselves hi Faye. uh thank you for that uh that presentation i i was just um thinking i, I was intrigued when you were talking about uh how you that moment of hesitation you had before you completed the drawing around the the lake, and when you mentioned that, I, I sort of thought of the I don't know if people are familiar with the Japanese or the Zen Enso, the incomplete circle, um, and I guess I was thinking about the circle as a or the complete circle as a sort of symbol of perfection, and I wondered if you could talk a bit more about what was going on. I know you went into it a little bit, like in inside you when you had that hesitation and if you thought about if you ever considered kind of just not completing it or, or you know what if just what was going to that moment a bit more yeah Maxwell thanks so much for that um great question and um oh you know I I often return to that moment <laughs> I could be sitting on the train um coming back from a busy day and I come back to that moment this is moment for me um and it's resolved and unresolved which i suppose is why i keep coming back to it i really wasn't expecting this to happen i i thought that i was drawing a line around the circumference of it and when i when i started to walk towards the point where i started um there was just this incredible sense of 
whole myriad of emotions taking place that were quite overwhelming. Um, and I, as I said, I, I stopped. And everyone stopped and, and the, the feeling in the air was electric and you could feel, nobody said anything. But afterwards, when we all talked, everyone said, everyone was thinking, what is going on? But they knew that something was going on. So what was, why, why did I have that, that um, moment? <laughs> and I seriously did think about not connecting. And I think, I think that's where I stopped. And I thought, what? I'll step away and that's that's what I need to do but for some reason my feet were firmly fixed <laughs> on the ground so my mind is saying step away that's the right, right thing to do my feet on the ground were stuck to the ground and I was literally frozen and it wasn't an, um, it wasn't unpleasant it wasn't a, there was an anxiety there for sure it wasn't um, but there was no but there was something going on between my mind saying, you know, this is great, you can, you know, move away, and my body saying, no, we're staying. And I was, you know, it was quite an arduous process, which is the idea of pilgrimage as well, which I, why I mentioned Crow Patrick and people walking up Crow Patrick bare feet. You know, I, I drew around the lake, I slightly attached a stick to the graphite, but my walk wasn't a nice standing up walk looking around. I was bent down walking around, you know, the lake that was part, and that was intentional um, to, you know, for my body to contort in that particular way so I'm stuck in this position um, feet sort of slightly apart body down graphite on the ground and then I had a conversation with the graphite and I thought okay so maybe it's not about taking the step forward maybe I need to pick the graphite off the surface and that's the end point and so I went through this conversation in myself where, where the, that wasn't going to happen either. And some, there was something extraordinary going on about my mind trying to sort, resolve a situation and my body saying, no, this is the situation we're staying right, we're staying right here. And so I just, you know, I was quite, I mean, if we were there for an hour, I think it was about 10, 15 minutes I was, I was there. Um, but I, at one point, I just sort of, I realised I wasn't breathing, so I just sort of settled into a, where I was and and what was happening, and tried to let the mind settle down a little bit and stop the mind from trying to work the situation out. And then my arm just moved, and my body just stepped forward, and I completed the line and brought it together. But at the point that I then brought it together, I also slightly stopped again. And then I just picked the graphite up. But what happened there was that then I just turned around and I took someone's hand and opened their palm. And then I drew a line down there, down their palm. And then I took the next person's hand and I drew the line. And so this became this real sort of mark on the body of the line. And that was... There was no thinking behind that, that something, it just happened. And I think that that step point and that still point led to that point where I was drawing the line on, on everyone's hand. And everyone said that they just felt that that was just an incredible moment when I just took a hand, held the hand, the palm out and drew the line. Um, complete silence, no, no speaking by anyone at all. And everyone just stood there very quiet and still. Um, so there's, in a sense, Maxwell, I think what happened there was, although I completed the circle, in a sense, the line continued. And that, and became, um, uh, well, this idea that um, we become the lake, yeah. The line becomes the lake, we become the line, we become the lake. So it becomes that we around the lake, drawing, walking, it all becomes one, one, one thing, one entity. But it is something I still return to in my thoughts quite frequently. Um, and um, I'm really glad you asked me that question. Thank you. Is um, walking and drawing something that, that, that you do? Um, yeah, I haven't really done a lot of, uh, of them at the same time or, or really 
you know, gone very far in, into the in, into the a kind of combination of the two. But it, obviously, it's something I'm interested in, and that's why I'm here. But um, I don't really have anything as far as a personal practice to share. But this has been great. It's been good to hear great from interest. everyone. Thank you so much for your wonderful question. This was also, going back to something that Gert said, this was also a silent walk. I, I suggested to people that when we did the pilgrimage around the lake, um, to be mindful of place and to connect to the body, which everybody did. And um, I'm particularly silent at this point where I couldn't complete the line and, and drew the lines on people's hands. And I wondered um, whether anyone else had um, participated in with others. Something I really love to do, I go for a walk with a companion or a friend and you, you don't talk, you just walk together. It's just gorgeous. Um, and then you sit and have, open up a flask of tea and a natter and then pack it up and then off you go again. Um, it's a sign for me of a really deep connection with someone that you go walking and you need to, to talk, you walk together. It feels like deeply connected. Does anyone else, anyone else do that or? Um, in uh, a comment of Ellie in the chat, um, maybe but, um, Ellie, you want to um, uh, tell us about it? Uh, maybe not right now. It's sort of it's more about the pilgrimages things that I was having thoughts on. So maybe not right now. But um, just thinking about the silent walks, I did a slow walk once in a big group, which was sort of accidentally silent. I don't know if that was the direction. Um, but yeah, that's a very odd experience too. Um, I'm just yeah, reading I, Oh. Uh, <laughs> no. Yeah, some provocations oh, yeah, on the cool. idea of directions and uh, destinations in pilgrimages. No, this idea of walking with the flow of water is something that I um, do in the river. It's just interesting. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> it was um, interesting to hear about you walking in the ditch of a henge monument um, on a well on a different level. I did a lot of walking in gutters when I was researching how water moves through the city, and uh, I my I did a master's research project on the movement of water and streets as public space. Um. So. Uh, um, what did I bring up? Yeah, like what? So I was walking, trying to follow water through the city was sort of a provocation I was using to to drift, I was calling it, but not in a strict situational sense. Um, yeah, so why that was to get kind of embodied knowledge about how water moves through a city and how that might relate to how people and humans move through cities. But it's so interesting that I cannot imagine this pilgrimage walk I'm trying to develop the other way around from north to south rather than south to north. It's just so curious. That I... so you're, going against, you're going against the flow of water. Hmm. No, yeah, I, that's, yeah. that's so the thing. I can't, the... No, I can't, can't conceive of doing it against the flow. <laughs> hmm. So let's look at that a bit closer. What, what's the hesitation there? Yeah, it's curious. Um, I don't know, it's complicated. Um, part of it, I think, is this uh, preoccupation with letting water guide my movement. Um, I am yet to find water that runs uphill to a drain, so um, but I also wonder if it's something to do with uh not wanting to walk against the river yeah. anyway. I was about to say, it's the, rhetoric, it's the rhetoric of the against, yes. Yeah. So yeah. are you really walking against the water or is yeah. there another word or another language that potentially feels more aligned 
that is not the the provocation of going against but mm. a different kind of relationship to the water you have a deep connection with the water as it in its flow direction so you're interested in engaging with the water um in its in the in the reverse of its flow but but there's the hesitation that going against the flow is not actually what you want to do, or well, maybe it is what you want to do, and that's where the um, where the resistance is. Yes, in research, the resistance, the rupture, of course, is where we all find the rupture. Yeah. The rupture I should just it. try it for, at first, at least. <laughs> what, if it feels there, wrong, it's wrong. Would there be another? I know, but sometimes in pilgrimages, if you do it wrong, then there's you know. There's, <laughs> <laughs> and and we don't want to do that um so <laughs> what would be um another word if you weren't going to use against like not against Oof. um hmm. yeah well ugh, trying to the only, the only things i can come up with is sort of like that it's more effort to go upstream Oh, upstream. Uh, well, upstream in, That's a fairly upstream neutral one. Itself. Yeah, upstream mm. in itself is a nice turn of phrase. Um, up's quite a positive uh, way. And, um, okay. you know, so you're in the up direction with the flow. Yeah. It could be reversal. Yeah. Yeah. Ellie, can I just I ask thinking, you? Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, you go ahead. I'll ask right. her after. I was just thinking, walking toward the river kind of came to mind because mm -hmm. you would you would be sort of going toward the source of the of the water i mean however yeah true however yeah. far away that is or yeah. inaccessible right yeah yeah so toward rather than against is a just completely reframes it it sort of shifts the focus from the actual flow of the water and take kind of takes a step back to see that as a as a it's like a whole body of water rather than just they're kind yeah. of on a smaller level. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Ellie, um, Ellie did, when you did your research for that, for the walk, didn't it take you from the river upstream? Because I was really surprised that you would have been able to find the water the other way around. Did you, where, what was your starting point? Um, so that it's um, initially like wastewater. So yeah. rain and um, the sort of utilities you can see sometimes where the pipes are underground where the yeah. you know where the, the the road surface is different when they put them in um and then i ended up becoming a little bit obsessed with the river here in brussels which was um moved sort of rerouted underground as a giant engineering project in the mm -hmm. mid late 19th century i think um and it's uh I wanted to, what I want to do is sort of shift the narrative of it, which is this, yes, your triumph over this evil poisonous river that was giving everyone cholera, basically. And they forget that there was, the reason it was poisoned is because people kept throwing all their nonsense into it. So uh, the source of it is, I forget, it's somewhere outside Brussels and it flows into the sea beyond Brussels. So I sort of approached it from the middle I suppose. And went um, both ways. Yeah, or just a longer section of it. Um, yeah. Above ground then. There's no trace of it at all in the city today. There are just street names like um, Carp Bridge Street or like Big Island Street. And it's just cobbles and streets and pavements. And it's it's a real shame that there's no trace of it on the surface. So, <laughs> But it's really interesting following from the street names, isn't it? I've done that with the river in our town and to yeah. find those traces on the surface. Yeah, yeah. I found, I by accident, I was following a map from 1815, I think, and mm -hmm. accidentally found Rue de la Seine, like Seine Street. So that was a pretty wonderful moment too. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I want to try leaving wet footprints along it maybe not something something i could graphite on a stick i was thinking about chalk and of course francis alice and the paint can yeah yeah that would be a really interesting way to do it too but and andy goldsworthy's work where mm -hmm. he drawings his rain prints mm -hmm. things um 
yeah, I think there's something you can do there. And and what's nice with um with those, well, Francis Alice's uh, work will be a permanent inscription. Yeah. Um, but you could, if there's this ephemeral presence, invisible presence of the river, that idea that your inscription is seen and unseen is quite an interesting. Yeah, play. I think I find that more interesting mm -hmm. as a, 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 I guess, city drawing in a way to draw that route, but it won't last. I find that more interesting, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And comes visible and fades as 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 is the river itself. Um, yeah. Nice. Some nice experiments. Thank you so much for everybody. You. Thank you. <laughs> it's fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. And welcome to Babak's cat. Babak, what is the name of your cat? Uh, this is uh, Lady Catterley. Mm -hmm. Lady Catherine. <laughs> it's very fluffy. <laughs> yeah, very fluffy. Got uh, Mr. P <laughs> over the bed currently over there, but he's normally the one that shows up in the cafes. Lady Catherine normally uh, is in stereo over there. <laughs> she's clearly not getting enough attention. No, uh, well, she's interested in water. <laughs> yes. Got the tricky thing there too. Interested right. in the conversation, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess a quick question, Faye, was uh, do you think the graphite might show up in another walk? Or is it just yes. for this one? No, I think that's why I um uh there's two in those what I would refer back to again. Um, boxes. There's that one, um, and then there's one. Um, oh, that's a story to tell about uh, Crete and Berlin and all sorts of things. Um, and Athros. Um, that's been an ongoing project for a few years. Um, uh, but um, it's there in the vitrine, and it's waiting um, for whatever moment it happens to reveal itself back. Um, so there, something will happen, but I, I have no idea when or where or what. Um, but the graphite itself, which is why I showed you the picture, you know, as an archaeologist, that's an artifact of the walk. And the wearing down and the shape of the wearing down of the graphite, you can see that I've walked with it in one angle and I've obviously unconsciously switched it to another way, another angle. But that is, um, that's, also is um, the the inscription, the shape of the walk, part of the walk there as well. So I really see that as the material cult, one of the material culture of the walk. It's like a hand axe, like an ancient hand axe. Um, and um, I find it quite powerful. I find I opened that box recently to take the photographs of this presentation, and I literally like. <gasps> <laughs> took the lid off and there was the box with the moths and the graphite and it's like um so i yes i'll i don't know how and when but it's it's an invitation as with all pilgrimage things of course we have these these this things this material culture of the pilgrimage and um uh totems talismans of language and rhetoric around them um but um yeah they they hold power that's for sure i don't know does anyone else have any um things from a walk or collections from a walk that they keep as a contained collection or or a thing in itself that's present in your life as you move around maybe it's something on a mantelpiece or something but that that is is somehow uh representative of the presence of the walk within your everyday life um i create objects for walking mm. so in some ways they're i don't know they're a trace of a walk but also an invitation to the next walk mm. i'm not sure quite where i'm going with that i think they're kind of an invitation but i like the idea of an object that you walk with and perhaps it picks up things through all the walks that you take and then becomes an invitation to somebody else. Mm. I'm kind of 
I'm kind of thinking about that at the moment. I'm not quite sure what form it's taken, <laughs> but I've been, I, it's just something I'm playing with. Jackie, that's interesting. So when you say create objects, did you want, did you want to expand on that a little bit? I think it would be something handheld that would make you look at something or make you walk in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, perhaps it just takes your eyes to a different place or it makes you walk differently. I'm not quite I'm not quite sure. I think it's probably would go in many directions, but I've been thinking about, you know, how I want to make something material from a walk and but that seems to be the right thing because most of my work is more about invitation and you know, talking to other people and allowing them to you to have their own experience. So I think it's some sort of object that's passed on or left out for other people. I don't know if anybody else has actually tried anything, has done anything along those lines. I guess I guess you have a bit, Faye, with the with those um, with the kinetic drawing machines, like giving those mm -hmm. to people. It's asking mm -hmm. them to experience a walk in a different way, isn't there? So that's a yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I um, I was just thinking of my pockets as you were talking there. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you know me, you'll know that my pockets are like nests, you know, and they... Mine are too. <laughs> things that you pick up, you know, there's like yeah. a seed, a bottle top, whatever it is, and they just become these kind of things. And, um, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a walk or a lot of walking those, and I'm very resistant to, you know, from, you know, empty my pockets because somehow they're kind of holding something and um there is yeah there's many ways you can can think about that jackie and go around that whether you i suppose what you're saying is you make something prior to the walk as as an intention statement to make yeah possibly walk. yeah um, but it might draw on another walk like it might be cumulative Yes, there is a practice with some walking artists of creating bundles. I don't know if you've seen the bundles. He's oh, that's people. James, isn't it? James Aldridge, yeah. yes, he bundles. Um, and he's part of a tradition of previous artists that yeah. had these walking bundles. Mm. Um, so, and then they become, you know, they become their own. Well, but that's that's making while you're walking. And I think what you're saying is making something prior to the walk. Yeah. And also because um, I'm very much into sort of tactile objects, and I think for me it's almost like some sort of handling object, because what you're saying about the pockets, and often I have something in my pocket that I'm turning and thinking about, and either I'm thinking about that sort of experience, I think. Hmm. But I'm thinking about how that relates to the walk, and um, yeah, it needs, it needs some thought, but I'll get, I'll get there on it. It's... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's perhaps yeah. it's perhaps not visual maybe it is something that stays hidden away and you've just got your hand on it or it's clenched in your hand yes this known and unknownness is such an interesting thing particularly when we think about the body there was a paper i wrote a, a while ago actually and it's 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 going to seem like I'm going off tangent, but I'm not. Um, and it's about um, body ornamentation in um, later prehistoric Europe when people were wearing these really elaborate body ornamentation um, and um, of all kinds of things. Um, but the tradition in some of the body ornamentation, particularly around Central Europe, um, where the, um, so you might say a bracelet, for example, a very large, chunky bracelet, but actually the decorate, so the decoration is on the inside of it, or the inscription is on the inside. So it's, so it's a necklace, but actually the, the decoration of the inscription is on the back, so it touches the skin. And, and it's the point of it touching the skin that's the important thing. So the, the body ornamentation is not necessarily about projecting out um to, for a display or whatever the theory is that you want to explore with that but it's actually about wearing something that has that skin contact there and i think there's something in walking that there's a nice way of thinking there to think about that with walking particularly with your project as well your object as it were yeah. visible or invisible body is a thing among things yes
Um, that Merleau Ponty quote. So, um, so that you know, there could be that hiddenness. The same for you, Ellie, as well, with your walk out visible, your visible footprints, your invisible footprints, your your known river, your invisible river. There's a wonderful interplay with all of this. You know, that we can step in, into space between that invisible and invisible and see that whole other world that's in there. It's not actually a clear line, it's a really diffuse connection between the visible and invisible. And in a sense, our walking, you know, is um, if you go on a long walk, I, I do a lot of stuff with the, you know, that point where things come into view as a phenomenologist, of course. But, you know, that, you know, you take the walk, whether you know the walk or not, to the hill, but you don't see the hill while, when you start the walk, but you're walking towards the hill that at some moment will reveal itself to you. Um, and if you know the walk, you know the point that that view shed point where it comes into view, or if you don't know the walk, then you're like in anticipation. When am I? Um, so there's a lot of interplay between that visible and invisible now. That as walkers we can just step into <laughs> with a wonderful, you know, experimentation. If I may add to that, uh, very essentially my work is, is that contrast between appearing and disappearing. I'm very much fascinated by disappearing uh, in my artistic work. And, and I come from a musical background, and, and in music, it's like say obvious the music you make disappears on the moment you create it and cannot be preserved. And um, I was always fascinated as well by the Greek philosophy. In, in, in the letter, uh, Plato writes, um, uh, the, um, um, that um, the essence of his philosophy uh, was actually never um, written down, but uh, only the, the things that were written down were actually the, only the, the less important uh, ideas he had. And the real important ideas, the essential ideas, you cannot deserve in, in in a text, they have to be communicated, or to be lived, or to be given um, to personal uh, teaching. And um, from that's it's a quite provocative because many of the work, uh, not I did a lot of work with Stefan van Biesen together, and this is very well documented. He's an artist that, that documents everything. That's a, that it's a, uh, he will not let one thing passed without having a trace of it. And then the work I did with Maria Lise, or the work I do personally, I, uh, it is my um, almost my objective not to leave any trace of anything I, I do, not even a photograph. Uh, just uh, let the experience and, and be, it's always in group, it's always together with people. You have a festival in Holland, which is called the Unseen Art Festival, uh, which uh, actually invites uh, artists to send in a performance a script or a prompt and they know that it will be performed, uh, that it, um, um, but they will never know where and when and with who, and the public or the audience is uh, incidental. So if it is, when it is performed, uh, it is not announced, so the people that pass by will take part in it or see it. But uh, for the rest, you will never know uh, when and where it happened, that will not be documented. So it's very provocative because I know for many artists, it's. Uh, it's it's subversive to, to, to say this, that just to let go, just to let happen, and especially for an archaeologist as you, which I'm a nightmare for you, I suppose, because I don't leave any place, <laughs> uh, any place at all. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, I think maybe the the the, the, from the, uh, the there is a sort of paradox in this, because um, uh, by disappearing or by letting no trace, actually you are sort of remembered. Uh, the, the, uh, the, you will, it, it, it leaves, uh, to my opinion, it leaves even an almost bigger impact not to leave something behind than to leave something behind. Uh, and, uh, because you become something that is not, you cannot grasp, you cannot, uh, you cannot name it, you cannot define it. It's, it's there and it is, um, it's even more powerful than some object uh, that can be uh, Manipulated and used, and, and uh, the, anyway, that, that is just a, a thought that I wanted mm. to throw in. Thank you, Gert. That's wonderful, wonderful stuff. Yes, I, it's funny, you know, that the trace. Yeah, of course, archaeologists are very invested and interested in traces. 
I suppose for me, I, I'm really interested in the point where it's almost not there. And I've um, excavated on a site where I'm pulling back very thin layers of soil. It's an agricultural landscape. And I understand the stratigraphy of the soil. And I pull back a very thin layer of soil. And in front of me, across the surface of the soil, is a two or three dark marks in a line. And those are the marks of a plough as it went through the soil in the Bronze Age, for example, which means somebody was walking in that direction. The thing is, is that the minute I pull it back and it reveals itself, it then disappears. And that moment of the softest trace is the most powerful experience and connection with somebody 5,000 years ago who walked that line that I'm looking at at that moment and then it fades and it's gone and that is the most beautiful archaeology for sure. Um, so the power in the ephemera, in the softest trace in the unseen is uh, an invitation for all of us to go and do some extraordinarily unseen work. <laughs> that would be a great conversation to have. <laughs> yes. yeah. I'm sure that many things will stay unsaid in this conversation as well, but maybe they are also <laughs> the most beautiful. Um, yes. uh, anyway, we are, we are going now to uh, quarter to uh, at least 11 in my uh, mm -hmm. if, you, if somebody has a last question last remark something you want to share uh, please do so and then we go back to silence mm -hmm. uh, just a quick observation about the relics we were talking about I think that I, about this time last year, I left my coat on a train by accident. I don't miss the coat. I miss the pebble I had in my pocket. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all completely understanding of that dilemma you have there. <laughs> yes. uh, the pebble that you will think about in years to come. <laughs> yeah. And the pebble is not gone. It's still there. Yeah. <laughs> Waiting for you to find it again. Yeah. <laughs> then uh, it was me, uh, except uh, uh, Baba, if you want to say something more, uh, then uh, to, uh, uh, to thank you and to thank you all for uh, this uh, conversation.